welcome to the um, North American Fund Manager Survey 2024 roundtable. Uh, so the plan is today is to, with um, some of my fellow panelists, to discuss some of the results that have come from this year's survey that Accorian conducted. Um, I'm joined by um, four extremely experienced individuals in and around the capital raising, legal, structuring and regulatory space. Um, and I'll let them introduce themselves and, and then we'll kick right on with our discussion. Maybe ladies first, Susan, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, hello. I'm, as you said, I'm Susan Burkhart. I am a partner in the funds and investment management group at Clifford Chance. I've been at Clifford Chance for about three years. Before that, I was in house for about 10 years, primarily at Blackstone Credit, but also at Apollo and DE Shaw. Uh, I primarily focused on fund formation and new product development in those roles while in house. And I was also intimately involved in Blackstone's creation of its Luxembourg AFM. Uh, before that, I was a fund formation associate at a U.S. law firm. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Sticking with our North American cousins, John, maybe you just want to introduce yourself. You bet. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, John Spencer, I'm a uh, managing director at TriWest Capital Partners. We're a uh, mid-market uh, bio fund um, based in Calgary, Canada. Been around for, for about 25 years. Um, I sit on a number of our portfolio company boards and uh, along with uh, another individual firm, uh, another individual at our firm, uh, I head up our fundraising effort. Uh, so keen to uh, chat with all of you today. Great. Uh, ben, why don't you uh, go next? Thank you, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Lamping. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of, of Reframe Capital. We are a go-to-market uh, specialist for private market managers, supporting them with organizational strategy, uh, product design development, and uh, and capital raising. And uh, we have uh, various other tools in the toolbox where we help managers and guide them through ESG implementation and with debt advisory solutions. So a multitude of tools in the toolbox to support growth. Prior to Reframe, I was a product leader with firms like JP Morgan, Winton, uh, Naveen, and uh, originally I, I started out in, in legal private practice. Thank you, Paul. That's great. Great, and then, um, Finally, but not least, colleague Ed. Thanks, Paul. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ed O'Bree. I work for Beauville, and we're a regulatory consultancy based um, based around the world in, in financial centres. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be acquired by Accorian in February this year, so I'm now part of the Accorian family. And I advise fund managers of all of all sizes and persuasions, um, including lots of North American firms who are either setting up in the UK and Europe or who want to distribute across here. Fantastic. And, and my name is Paul Spendiff. I'm the head of sales for the funds group here at Aquarium. Uh, we help uh, around a partner with about 280 billion of assets under administration um, and have a particular focus servicing clients from North America looking to enter Europe for the first time. Um, so maybe quickly before we sort of kick on with some of the results, I'll, I'll just set the scene. So in April 2024, Aquarium commissioned a survey amongst 100 fund managers. 75 of those were in the US and 25 from Canada. And all of the respondents were, were senior executives working as fund managers, investment analysts, COOs, CFOs, CROs, head of product, head of compliance and head of legal within five sectors. So private equity, real estate, infrastructure, private debt and VC firms. So really our audience in the, in the alternative space all around real assets. The value of funds varied. So 7% of those uh, managers were between one and 5 billion. 47% of the largest segment were between five and 10 billion. 31% were between 10 and 25 billion. 12% between 25 and 50 billion. And 3% were between 50 and 100 billion. So a real spread, but really looking at the mid to, to, to sort of mid to small to mid, large size mid managers in that space. Um, and they were asked a series of questions and really what we're going to do is just get amongst the weeds now and look at some of those results uh, and then see see what we um, what we think and, and, and really what, what we think is driving that. So one of the first questions we asked was thinking about funds uh, that the clients that the um, that the uh, firms managed. 
Do they currently raise capital in Europe? And, and quite a significant amount, 83% were actually already present and raising money in Europe. Um, not necessarily with a European product or, or a European presence, but perhaps you know, through reverse solicitation or private placement. But it was interesting to see that you know, quite an international outlook from, from, those, um, from those investors. Um, Susan, maybe if we start with you, obviously one, I think one of the first people when people think about raising money in, in, you know, outside of the US and, and Canada, We'll, we'll often come to their legal counsel. Does that does that kind of resonate what what you've been seeing you know, historically over recent years from from North American based managers? Yeah, thanks, Paul. It definitely does. I I think you know when I when my clients come to me, they typically are kind of somewhere on a spectrum. You know, some have have zero European you know investors, but most have at least a handful um, that they've you know acquired through relationships. Um, you know that the that the portfolio managers have, that the CIOs have. Um, and then usually they're coming to me to say, OK, we have a little bit of we have some European investor exposure. We're thinking about expanding that. You know, what are the ways we can do that? How, you know, what are the options? And you kind of want to talk to them about what their goals are there and what they're trying to achieve. And then you can help them kind of think about the best way to you know to access the EU investor market. Fantastic. I mean, John, John, when um, obviously you you are you know, recently coming to Europe you know, from 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 your homeland Canada, what you know, what was driving you to 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 come to Europe in terms of um, what was the biggest influence for you to to come here? Yeah, I think um, it, it, it's an interesting question because I think it's actually changed over time, um, and so certainly. At the onset, um, you know, there is an element of broadening broadening our investor base, as uh, as as some of your survey um, respondents indicated. I think the majority of them, um, but I think it came about uh, as part of a really tight fundraising environment in North America, and so you know, everyone's um, you know maybe has their kind of bespoke set of conditions as to as to why the um, as limited partners capital is tight. But we were commonly hearing things um, along the lines of. Our long duration bond portfolio is down significantly on the back of interest rates moving up. Um, capital that we have flowing into the business needs to be allocated uh, to strategies outside of, um, in our case, traditional private equity, simply for asset allocation reasons. Um, and so, you know, we think that's going to take some time to unwind, save, you know, interest rate environment that is uh, significantly declining in pretty short order. Um, so that's that's been part of our theory. Um, you know, we have, we've also found that LPs, I think, um, committed a lot of capital uh, in the period following COVID, uh, particularly in North America. And there seems like there's, um, you know, perhaps more capital availability for um, our type of strategy uh, in, in, frankly, a part of the world that uh, I think has an easier time understanding, understanding um, investing in a regional manager uh, who dominates the marketplace, but then has uh, portfolio companies, you know, that provide services to something like the United States. Um, so we've been uh, we've been quite uh, quite pleased with how our story has been received over here, and um, you know, hope it continues to be a big part of our strategy in the future. Great. So, so Ben, I mean, you know, one of the fifty three percent of the of those questioned thought the North uh, America offers some of the most attractive investment opportunities for investors and that European investors are looking for that alpha for want of a better word is that does that resonate with what you're seeing from from clients and, and investors on your side yeah no, I think there's uh, there's no question that investors certainly those that we um, that are within our network have a deep understanding of that value proposition from North America particularly. And so, but you have to look at that asset class by asset class. So let's take a specific example. In the infrastructure or renewable energy space, there are great benefits for, for, for investing in uh, North American um, infrastructure due to the Inflation Protect Protection Act and the subsidies that are available that support the growth of that industry. There are challenges in the European marketplace where you look at the lack of subsidies 
subsidies from government. And all of a sudden you start to see relative value opportunities which are specific to uh, the, the North America region. Um, I'd also take um, private credit as an example and the maturity of the US mid market. The strength of that market is something in which investors place a great deal of, uh, of comfort and, uh, and, and see uh, a value in, in the proposition, but also have a deep understanding of the, uh, of the fundamentals of that market. So there are very clear strengths of the North American market where investors have that understanding. But of course, it's important to look at how investors allocate across geographies and how um, a, a North American allocation fits into their portfolio. So that really comes back to understanding sort of what those investor motivations are. But uh, there's no question that there are attractive opportunities that investors are aware of and target. Okay, great. Um, Ed, anything to comment there or would you rather start thinking about the methods of capital raising and, and how people are using that to access the market? Uh, no, I, I, I think I'd agree with everything that's been said before. But in, in relation to um, the methods of, of capital raising, I mean, what's, what, what is certain is, is that uh, you do have options um, if you're coming into in, into Europe. And by, by Europe, I mean the EU, the UK and the, the European offshore jurisdictions as well. There are plenty of options. And as, as Susan alluded to uh, right at the beginning, I think it's important that uh, the incoming managers have a really good idea about what they're trying to achieve, who they're trying to attract, uh, what their tax expectations and, and requirements uh, those those investors, particularly cornerstone investors, are, are going to have, and that will help on um, uh, help on deciding what the, what the best method. Uh, of actually achieving that capital raising is going to be, and you don't have to limit yourself just to, to just to a single option. Um, but uh, but but of course, um, there, there are a uh, a number of different options that can be used in conjunction. I think it's important to to, to remember that. Yeah, look, look, I mean, if we, if we look at the results, we can see that that the past fourteen came out sort of top there, forty one percent, and reverse solicitation, and then the NPPR. Was sort of neck and neck at twenty five percent as the as the way that the U S. managers and, and and Canadian managers were looking to access uh, into to Europe and the U K. Uh, maybe Susan, do you want to just touch a little bit on on what what might draw a manager to to one sort of uh, route rather than another? Sure, absolutely. I you know in my experience, managers when they're thinking about coming to Europe, fundraising in Europe, um, they're really thinking about how broadly they're going to market their product. How, you know, do they have a handful of investors that they're seeking to target? Do they want to target, you know, investors more broadly? And, and where in particular are they interested in, in marketing? Are they interested in marketing in France? Is it Germany? Is it, you know, the UK? Is it Spain? Um, how broadly you're going to go and in what jurisdictions make a huge difference. Um, you know, if you want to go very broadly, the passporting is is obviously very effective. However, it's also very expensive. Um, if you have, you know, a set number of, of limited people you want to talk to, um, that NPPR can be better. Um, of course, there are some jurisdictions where the NPPR doesn't work. Um, and so you would have to rely on passporting. So there's, it's really, in my experience, kind of a balance between who you're marketing to, where they are, how many of them are, you know, are there, how many targets, and and what your budget is. Okay. If I could I jump, mean, jump in there, Paul, yeah, I, I, I would just say that understanding your target market is so such a, an important step prior to engaging parties to build or launch your product. It is looking at the fundamentals of the market across institutional channels, the wealth channel, that's something that I'm sure we'll talk more about, but in which there's significant growth today. And every one of these areas has a different dynamic today. There's been the denominator effect that we've seen really impacting institutional alloc allocations where firms are beginning to pivot and looking at the wealth channel as that, uh, that, that area for potential growth. You've got to look at DC pensions in the UK, local government pension schemes. So if you start to segment investors across different territories, you know, that, that country by country approach, that client uh, segment by client segment approach, it, it begins to develop a much more systematic approach to determining your target market and at which point you're, you're identifying priorities. It's not necessarily an indication of what, how your distribution model will, will be set for the future. Of course, you need to look at your ability to passport and access the European passport in future from a place in which you begin to build your substance. But starting from that 
investor landscape and then defining your target market and then mapping to that market where you think your capabilities will fit gives you that greatest chance of, of, of success, in, certainly in the early stages of raising capital. I mean, John, obviously, you've gone down the, the passporting route. Um, and um, obviously, I mean, according to, to the survey, 56% of, of managers thought they could access more investors. Um, 50, uh, same again in terms of how they were perceived by the market and those investors. And then 43% in the efficiency that, that Susan alluded to in being able to access multiple markets. What was your driver? What, what made TriWest think that actually that that passporting versus perhaps the reverse solicitation or some other method might have might have been preferable for you yeah i think it's actually somewhat related to what ben was touching on is we needed to spend some time having conversations with prospective investors to figure out where we were going to develop demand and so i think um you know, one of the one of the benefits that we've had in the call pre pre-marketing stage um, is just better understanding what investors are looking for. We, you know, we, we always think that we know, um, but I think we've been surprised as we've gone through some of those conversations, what they find appealing, um, you know, what, what are maybe the, the nuances of the investment highlights that we try and sell as a firm, how they work with them. So what, what we like about um, uh, the, you know, the passporting regime, if you will, so we think it gives us that flexibility in terms of understanding the market before we have to make broader decisions to go execute on plan. And that part's been, um, as we've come to understand it, there's certainly a lot more to understand around the uh, European regulatory framework than we were used to in Canada. Um, but as we've come to understand it, that's actually been a really helpful uh, um, dynamic of the whole regime. Paul, Paul could I just put, pull on another trend that, that I think the uh, the survey shows? Um, uh, of the respondents uh, who who, um, uh, who were asked, I think 63% have told us that they, they've used reverse solicitation in the past, whereas only 25% said they're planning to use it in the future. And I think that's really a, a, a result uh, of, of a couple of things. First of all, um, the, the European regulators really trying to, trying to tighten up and, and, and restrict that. Uh, and, and also still a degree of uncertainty as to how reverse solicitation up to the extent which is actually permitted from, from different jurisdiction to different jurisdiction. And I think that's I think that's just generally off-putting, uh, particularly for, um, for for firms that are recently uh, recently starting to, to raise capital in, in Europe. And I have to jump in. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think when people are thinking about reverse solicitation, there are so many facts and circumstances that go into whether, you know, you think something will be a good reverse solicitation. And, and then there's very little hard and fast guidance. Um, so I think when in the early kind of days post AFMD, people were thinking, you know, people kind of weren't ready um, to do passporting. They weren't ready to to comply. They've had now 10 years um, since AFMD came into place. You know, they were relying at first on, on the only thing that they knew how to do from before, which is the reverse. And I think they've educated themselves over time and really gotten, you know, to understand what needs to be done and what they can do. And, and we've gotten some great service providers um, that have jumped into, you know, the void to help people who, you know, to help firms who kind of aren't able to handle all of the responsibilities um, of marketing in the in the EU by themselves. Susan, I'm assuming you're talking about a core in there, so that's very kind. Of, of course, <laughs> of course. Well done. Yeah. We'll, we'll pay you later, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and I think the trigger was, was very much two summers ago that this definition of pre-marketing by ESMA, which was a loophole that many U.S. Uh, North American managers were using to access, uh, it was a grey area. And, and the clarification that came with those rules about what was and wasn't permissible under pre-marketing, that then if you relied on that, you then couldn't trigger that reverse solicitation. So this concept previously of using pre-marketing as an entree into relationships, which you then flipped and claimed were reverse solicitation has been shut down. So that 18 month rule uh, really does shut, I guess, the last closing of the last door for, for, for managers who, who were relying on that in scenarios that perhaps reverse solicitation wasn't a true a, a description of what was necessarily happening. So I think that maybe that was a gray area, maybe people were still using that. And I think that you know, this has finally come to an end and people are thinking about. So that was probably the push I mean, I feel like the pull is, is the investors wanting to have a European product, wanting to have uh, presence in Europe, recourse, uh, regulation and oversight, independent valuations, all of which come with European product. 
Just, just, just to be clear. Please, what, please so, go, go ahead. After you. After you, then. Thank you. Um, no, I, I think what it shows is that um, manager distribution models are maturing. And it shows that the early stage engagement that firms are making is uh, is much more structured and systematic. They they're, they're looking to gather intelligence before they build that presence, before they they can actually uh, start to sort of take these products out in, in earnest. It's the ability to gather intelligence that validates a proposition, that it, it enables some input on commercial terms and expectations. Yeah, you know, there, there is a price discovery exercise there that managers must undertake to determine whether the fees that they have expectations of receiving are, are in line with the market. That has to be tested. Uh, but the beauty here is that that engagement allows them also to determine the appetite for offshore versus onshore structures and what features those structures have. I'm sure we'll talk more about the, the innovation in product structuring later. But the reality is that this sort of transition from closed ended to evergreen funds is also something that's salient and being borne out from those investor discussions, both institutional and in the wealth channels. And so all of that in intelligence can be gathered first, which means that firms are not you know, working at the same burn rate of having to build an operation first and then engage with investors. This is first stage. And that's the right order, certainly as we see it, uh, again, to have success in that uh, distribution uh, cycle. Ed, I think you... Thanks. I, I was just just going to add that the 18 month rule and, 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 and those difficulties, obviously, that's that's for the EU only. It doesn't cover the UK, Switzerland, Jersey, Guernsey. Point. Yeah, absolutely right. Pre-marketing has not been uh, given the, the UK left. So thanks, said that's that's useful colour. Uh, John, so okay, so so obviously different routes to market and and different approaches in terms of how uh, product is created. Let's think then about maybe distribution, which is obviously the other the other sort of side of the coin. What you know, our research was was that 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 sixty one percent said they were using placement agents. Um, 49 percent sort of direct sales team and 47 percent uh, third parties um, in terms of so it sounds like there's more than one it seems very rare that someone mm -hmm. go down a single a single path and does that does that reflect the, the route you've taken or have you taken a sort of you, you've outsourced this completely how how is tri west looking at this yeah um so, so we're using more than one route for sure um and we're you know we're we're early days in our our fundraising effort in Europe and so um my perspective is uh perhaps interesting in that it's only my perspective we don't have a whole bunch of points of comparison like i think the uh the balance of you do but um we've always been firm believers that you know like okay, our our limited partners are our customers and we're going to have a better business if we have a business built around relationship with those customers so that we can understand where we're delivering and where they think we're not delivering. And um, so we're, we're going to have some element of direct sales. That's why we're spending time in Europe. It's why we're getting to new LPs. Um, it's, it's, it's why we're uh, you know, committed to being here for a long time. Uh, we don't view this as a, a point in time exercise. It's something that's going to be an ongoing effort for our firm. That said, um, we do think that um, you know, engaging with the placement agent is a very good way of developing a network of prospective limited partners so you can build relationships with, with in a way that we won't be able to do on ourselves, uh, by ourselves, I should say. So, you know, we don't have the brand name of, you know, Blackstone or KKR behind us where, um, you know, perhaps we can get uh, uh, meetings with investors just based on, um, you know, the, the, the business card that we're carrying. Um, we think that, Having a placement agent helps qualify us as a meeting or as a group that you should get to know. Um, and so we think they're of significant value. Um, interestingly, we've never used a placement agent in North America for any of our fundraising activities because we have those relationships already. Um, it's well traveled and we have a we have a brand that works for us in the space that we participate in. Um, but when for Europe, or I'd say, you know, we're we're starting fresh with obviously much fewer relationships. Um, you know, we think it'll be kind of that kind of dual strategy. Let's let's build the size of network, but then um, let's ensure that we're bringing those relationships in house with kind of our direct effort. And ben, I know you you obviously do sort of act as a placement agent as one of the services that Reframe offer. Does that does that connect you? Tip to guys, typically your clients who use you typically come to you and say, okay, yes, for this market only, or for this type of client, or do they do they come sort of? And give you the, the whole mandate how does it look typically for you 
Yeah, I, I would say that there is no such thing as a, as a typical mandate in truth, Paul, because uh, every firm comes with a different focus, um, you know, a different strategy, and uh, the ideal client comes with uh, a willingness to listen on where we think that uh, that placement is is most effective, where the opportunities really lie, and it becomes that mapping exercise together. Uh, it's interesting hearing John that um, that that you you've not used placement agent services in the US because what we often find actually is that North American uh, managers have that better understanding of how to plug and play with uh, with placement agents uh, relative to their European counterparts. Actually, um, <laughs> but the reality is that I strongly believe that there's no one size fits all either that we have an ability to augment an established sales and distribution team looking for those areas in which we can add value but that becomes that discussion to shape a distribution mandate and opportunity set identifying those areas in which we add value and that can be with particular client channels that can be based on particular strategy expertise but we feel very strongly in this concept of utility and distribution and so it's first that focus on the manager where is that value proposition but how do you how does that strategy solve a problem that others in the market cannot and that becomes part of the story and that becomes part of the uh the, the go-to-market proposition and that all has to be developed in conjunction with the manager so there's that real need for partnership for those placement agent relationships to succeed and not all adopt that uh, that 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 model so it's a case of finding that right partner where you believe culturally there's a, a dovetailing but where the firm can obviously extend into relationships that you feel you don't have uh where, where they can add value Absolutely. And, and Ben, presumably um, you're offering your prospective clients incredible efficiency. And in, once you understand the story, probably help them refine and articulate their story in a way that's going to be relevant for um, the pockets of capital that you're familiar with. But then knowing where that demand exists so that you can be more targeted in your approach in terms of developing an opportunity set, uh, maybe in a jurisdiction where you're, you know, it's not your home country, uh, it's not your home continent. Um, you know, that's fast, that's faster right. speed. Look, yeah. there's a retrofitting exercise here. You know, our job is to know the investors that we serve and have built relationships with over many years. The manager is new to that relationship, but it's a case of understanding where that deployment opportunity lies and, and, and mapping that uh, that opportunity set. So uh, there is absolutely that uh, that exercise. But speed to market is, is one thing, but we equally have to manage expectations that the sales process is not a, a floodgates, never brings about a floodgates moment. Uh, yeah. There is a, a, a an outbound outreach exercise that still requires expectation management in a lot of ways. Uh, but what, what I think is the outcome of an effective placement agency relationship is one which uh, achieves a greater level of success and outcome and a relationship building with strategic partners that can help support your firm over uh, the long term, as opposed to a quick mandate here, a quick mandate there, because these are firms that one are often investing in open ended products that can exit quite quickly if it's not a true fit. Uh, but also yeah. that strategic alignment is something where these firms offer something beyond just that initial uh, yeah, capital allocation. Let's talk about family offices for a moment. Often they move together. Those relationships are often very strong between those firms when one commits they often bring a network of others so you've got to see the value of those networks as well and that level of engagement and understanding of the uh, the investor segment is just so important but it comes back to that target market are they within or are they outside and are they the right fit for the strategy that you intend to take out all of that should be informed by that that, that placement agent and you should be judging the capability of that firm based on those early discussions and that scoping exercise Right. And then how to sell your product to that particular, uh, like, you know, a family office sale we find to be entirely different than an institutional sale. Like, no one's going to be surprised by that. But, yeah, you know, the, the relationship element is different. Um, the the can I reference check check you by, you know, talking to some other people that have done work with you. It's just it's a different ball game, and you might be selling the same the same widget, but you have to sell it in a very different way. 100%. Okay. Great. All right, good. So maybe let me think now about, so we sort of out a distribution strategy. We've raised some capital, hopefully. We're now thinking about, you know, from a, from a query, what were we asked about outsourcing? So, and outsourcing, and, and it's still difficult to get numbers, but the, the traditional assumption is about 50% of North American managers still self-administer their funds. So they don't have a third party administrator, but they continue to, to, to self-administer and create the own NAV, AML and KYC, the investors. 
They think they're closest to the assets. They think they're closest to the investors, and it's a well-trodden path. Clearly, that's not a model that's uh, as prevalent now for regulatory and um, governance reasons that we see in Europe. So it was interesting to to see when we spoke to the the managers, as we know some of whom have been raising money here for some time, about how they administered their funds. Six percent was still doing that in house, so significantly less than we we would think that the U.S. market would do domestically. Seventeen percent would have a single third party administrator. 42% had um, have more than one fund administrator. And then we see that 18 uh, and, and 17 would be a combination of, of in-house and third party. So, so a, a kind of mixed bag and, and, and potentially horses, of course. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll push this one to you. Um, what do you think the advantages are from maybe from a regulatory governance perspective from outsourcing this versus maybe looking in house? And, and how uh, how have you guys been supporting US managers in that regard? Well, I mean, there's there's sort of an, an, ob an obvious answer to that first question. Um, if if you're a, a new market entrant, um, uh, or or, um, or or perhaps. Uh, uh, perhaps it is established and seeking to grow um, within Europe. It'll give the, the 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 European regulators an awful lot of comfort if you're using uh, firms that they knew, that they know that are tried and tested from their perspective to provide these services to you, rather than seeking to um, seeking to learn it um, from, from 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 day one. So so there's a clear advantage there. If you need to get authorised or you need to get a a, a particular licence or registration, um, it can really help by showing that you've got some some blue chip um, outsource providers on hand. And, and Susan, do they do they often ask advice? It's a common practice when they're coming to you, and are you looking at those agreements that are coming across from 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 the uh, from these European fund administrators? Is that is that something that crosses your desk? It 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 is. Um, you know, it's it's certainly um, interesting to see those. You know, different different administrators have different approaches, um, and I think typically, you know, I see my clients making decisions based on you know. As, as Ed kind of mentioned, you know, the name, um, the ability of that administrator to deal with complexity, um, as you as kind of Ben and Paul, you both mentioned, you know, we're kind of moving into this open ended area. So, you know, people are thinking about, OK, I need an administrator who can handle open ended funds. Um, and, and, you know, I think the market there is is really developing. We we see actually a lot of difference in terms um, between various administrators, a lot of difference in how um, they handle things like, you know, boring and legal things like indemnification, um, but that end up kind of being important. Um, so I think it really is important for, you know, sponsors when they're looking at this to really do their due diligence and understand, you know, what, what services they're going to get, who, who's going to be providing them, where, in what time zone, um, responsiveness and, and, you know, technical ability, and then also, you know, what, what the actual terms will be. So there, there's, there's a wide variety and I, th I think people have a lot of choice, um, but they, there's a lot, you know, there, there are, you know, pitfalls out there in, in your choices. Yeah, I, I would just, um, I, I would add to that, that from experience and working with large North American firms that are expanding internationally, the starting point is to have discussions about your current and preferred uh, vendors and service provider partners to see to what extent they can evolve with your business to continue supporting you on a cross-border basis. I know from direct hands-on painful experience those challenges of having competing vendor relationships that are really pulling you uh, a, a apart rather than uh, achieving some convergence and, uh, and and service provider alignment so the truth is that you want to identify those partners that can support your uh, new structures cross-border business demand for investor support and solutions but i, I when we work with firms in helping to source select and integrate uh, service provider partners 
partners, what we often uh, look at are the services that are ancillary to the core proposition to say, what, what are the, where is the added value that comes from that relationship where you can support us in, in where we're evolving in many different ways. Uh, um, Susan already referred to sort of borrowing relationships and banking relationships and the connectivity that they have on the investor side. All of these things can inform and bring um, knowledge and intelligence to inform the decisions that managers have to make. And I see often that value um, being far greater, sort of disproportionately greater with the additional services that really provide a wraparound solution for, for the managers as they expand into new territories, territories where they need clear direction. And, and John, you, I mean, obviously you've gone down that combined AFIM depository fund administration route. Um, is that something, was there ever an alternative to that? Or was in your mind that was always the model that as a, as a new manager coming into Europe that, that you, you wanted to engage on? Yeah, I, I, th I think practically for us, um, th there, there perhaps wasn't an alternative. So we, we, we don't, um, you know, the, the Canadian private equity landscape is actually pretty unregulated. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, um, you know, our, our business, our you know, original LPs were all, um, you know, Canadian pension plans. So we do all kinds of reporting. Those are, you know, passive groups and there's nothing private about private equity is the, uh, the line that we use, like to use it uh, around the office. But that's different than reporting is different than regulation. So, so we felt like we were um, well prepared for anything from a reporting perspective but would have been doing some, something very naively to suggest that we could, you know, administer um, over in Europe ourselves. So we, we didn't really ever view that as an alternative. I, I think practically speaking, um, you know, one of the things that's quite clear to me, you know, as we continue on this um, European fundraising journey, if we were going to be ready to self-administer in Europe, the lead up time, to put in place that infrastructure and those people, and frankly, just the cost associated with that, is going to, like, it would you it would never make sense to do for a business with our circumstances. Yeah, Might I, be I, I'd, I'd add, I'd add okay. that. Um, there's the flip side to that, which again comes back to the investor and the extent to which there is increased scrutiny within due diligence processes net today around risks, controls, yeah. oversight. And so some degree of independence in many of these functions is seen very favorably by investors. And so that level of sophistication and rigor, you know, we, we talk about a six month process often between an initial investor engagement and, uh, and, and commitment. And sometimes that can be much longer. What goes on in that period is not just radio silence and holidays it is uh, extensive due diligence yeah. where people are exchanging a great deal of information so the established asset services that can support a manager in each of those stages uh, actually enhances that uh, that engagement process with investors and gives a great deal of comfort but the point to make here is that the model is challenged where with increased regulation ESG standards, investor requirements. That's placing greater pressure on manager business models and, and margins. And that's increasing the extent to which managers are looking to outsource many of these services. But what does it require? It requires a greater level of diligence by the manager to oversee those relationships. You can't just hand off and say, right, you know, the job is done. Someone else has got this yeah. and uh, they earn the two, three basis points that uh, that they make for, for that business. Not at all. The job is that those firms have to integrate well with your manager platform, because I've seen instances of former employers and, and clients where there are real challenges in a business model because of the lack of proper integration, say, between an AFM and, uh, and the manager and the oversight of investment activity. Activity, it can be a real impediment to doing good business uh, at, at key uh, times. And so the, it, what's important is there are effective KPIs, there's accountability on the part of asset services, and there's effective oversight by the manager. You have to remain vigilant about how those relationships continue to work with you. And over years, you should be enhancing and evolving those business models to, uh, to continue to serve how you're growing in different ways. Totally. Maybe just to touch yeah. on something you mentioned there, Ben, that I thought was really interesting. And, um, you know, th this is reading between the lines from uh, fr from my perspective. But if, if we're operating in a market that's tight on capital relative to opportunities, which I think is the marketplace they're operating in today, and you come along and you say, yep, um, we would, you know, you should, in, you should invest in our business, um, commit to our fund, go do all your due diligence. What I think you want to know as an investor, 
um, is that there's you're not going to go to do a whole do a whole bunch of work to find out that there's problems all over the place and you've just wasted a bunch of your time. And so having, um, you know, the, the third party or outsourced service in some senses offers a bit of credibility as to, again, establishing that this is a, you know, um, time well spent or if it, or it's a qualified lead, it's a qualified opportunity. And I think that, um, you know, particularly for someone in my circumstance, for instance, I think that's uh, that's a pretty valuable component of a marketing plan. Yeah, it's it needs it, you need to apply rigor in that process for going to market. You need to be institutionally ready before you start those conversations, not work it out as as you go. Definitely. For sure. OK, now, you, you mentioned some of the reporting then there and that, and that kind of like leads us kind of nicely into the world of regulation. So let's let's jump straight in. I think no one will be shocked to uh, to see the results of the survey around regulation. Sadly, only one percent of, uh, of North American managers thought that the European regulation was was in no way complex. Um, <laughs> I think, which I think is not a shock. So I think it's a shock. We found one out of a hundred. I think it's probably the shock there. Uh, and, and, the, and the others that it's sixty-two percent quite complex, and, and thirty-seven extremely complex. And maybe, maybe that, that with that shocking bombshell, I'll, I'll get you to comment on. Like, is it as complex as people think? Is this just an educational issue, or is are there really insurmountable challenges stopping Americans uh, and Canadians coming here and, and and successfully launching their and marketing their funds? Well, good good question. But before before I answer that, though, I mean, I think if you were to ask the same question of of European managers going into the US, they probably you'd probably have a fairly similar result. To be fair, although although and, and Susan Susan, I'm sure knows what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, the, the EU EU uh, and, and European uh, regulation is is complex. Um, what's what's interesting though from from uh, those people who answered our survey, so so I think we had 87 uh, no 83 percent who were already marketing uh in uh raising capital raising, in, raising money yeah i mean i was going to talk about reverse station but let, let's say 83 percent of, of raising 83 percent but of the of the remainder of the, that, that other 17 percent 76 percent of them planned to raise capital uh in europe in in the next two to three years which i thought was was quite interesting um so so what does that that mean yes we have complex uh, regulation uh, across europe and yes it is becoming more complex in, in the near future we've got dora the digital operational resilience act coming down the line we've got sort of increased um esg rules or, or those some of those coming online in the uk and the eu uh, in particular uh, we've got aifmd2 and the delights of that to look forward to over the next few years as, as, as that comes comes online um so it's it's you know a, a bit like um a bit like death and taxes you know one thing we can be sure of uh, these days is that eu rules european rules will become more complex of course but they don't seem to be putting people off that's because i think with you know with the right advisors with putting plans in place with with looking out at the horizon sort of a, you know years two years hence uh whenever you can um you you, you can deal with them all uh, and, and hopefully you know hopefully find some kind of an advantage uh in there as, as as many firms have with um uh with, with the new esg rules and, and Susan, when you when when those clients are having those initial and even subsequent conversations, are they, are they, are they, is there sort of buyer's remorse once they're in in here in Europe with you, sort of <laughs> trying to un, unpack the the next round of regulations that are coming their way? I mean, if you have a chance, fortunate you've got offices you're here in the UK, in, in Luxembourg and Ireland, one of two of the, the major fund centres, which which leaves you well placed, I guess, to support them. Is is, is that? Are they coming back to you with this kind of concern? I think they are. I think they are surprised by the complexity. They're surprised by kind of all of the documentation. I don't see buyer's remorse. Um, typically, I, I see I see you know eyeballs that are are wide when they see that the you know our expenses, for example, on reviewing the agreements. Um, that's not anything new. Um, but I, I think people are are ultimately you know pretty happy. I mean, again, not not to pander to my host, but I think the certain existence of service providers has made a lot of this much more um, doable for your kind of mid-market U.S., you know, U.S. or, or Canadian manager. Um, so many of the complexities are things that they have help with, um, have a lot of help with, have expert help with. And, you know, I think it's much more intimidating going into this 
if, if you don't have that kind of help. Um, so having having the right partners, I think, is is really key. And, you know, I've seen my clients who have been, you know, really thoughtful about about their choice of service providers, you know, have been have been pretty happy. Um, you know, they they understand it, it's complex. It's complicated. Um, you know, the U.S. is becoming more complicated, too. You know, we're 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 not nearly as good as the, at the EU as, as at regulating, um, you know, putting things in place. But but we're trying. The SEC is certainly trying. Um, and, you know, as, as I think we're I think as the U.S. becomes a little more complex, there's there's a little bit more tolerance for the complexity of, of what's going on in the EU as well. In, in John, is that are you comfortable that you understand what, what it is you've got yourselves into, but also <laughs> what that journey might look like over the next couple of years, and that you know you're well positioned to deal with with some of those uh, some of those regulations that that exist now, but also may come down the track in in the next kind of twelve to twenty four months. Yeah, I I, th I think for us it was um, it was comparatively different, um, and so I think that there's just kind of natural shock in that you you know you um the you, you don't appreciate necessarily what you have to do so everything comes across as a shock i i would characterize um at least our interpretation of what we understand to date and i'm always cognizant that there's probably something around the corner that i don't know about so um you know perhaps if we do this in six months time again i might have a, have a different answer but the complexity to me seems to be more driven by um just the scope it, it's so wide it, it catches so many things um and so there's a lot to be thinking about as opposed to particularly difficult hurdles to jump through that that hasn't been uh i think our reaction to uh to the regulations it's just how much there is to regulate um and so hey we, we actually look at that as an opportunity we, we sit there and say if we're going to go through um the effort of navigating all this with with great advice from great people um, as has been alluded to on uh, as part of this discussion, well, that should change this the demand and supply balance in terms of product available from North America to Europeans that's being market marketed with the right regulation. We think particularly in the space that we're operating in, lower mid market, um, you know, to overcome all that and then you know be able to have a product that you can offer in Europe um, is actually a pretty interesting um opportunities set for us to consider so we're actually quite excited about that i, I guess just as a general point on, on that you know we work with quite a number of emerging firms too so not just those that are new entrants to the region but those that are starting out uh, in, in in their entirety and the reality is that this is not a landscape in whatever territory you're 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 looking to grow in which you can do without a commitment where you can just simply dip your toe in there is a requirement to commit in these territories and so um of course the regulations set a, a higher and higher bar for substance regulatory substance tax substance uh, but the point is that with the right advice with the right partners these are not impediments to doing business and of course if you're looking for long-term stable growth um uh, and a, a, with a strategic mindset the reality is that there are answers to all of these questions that allow for that yep. growth to be to achieve, to be achieved and in an economically attractive way from both managers and from an investor standpoint where you're just not throwing all of those costs into a, a product and then saying right get on with it it is what it is there's there's much more to it than that so let's just look at one of those pieces of regulation so so ESG is is the the, the I guess the catch word for in particularly here in Europe with the uh, SFDR um, labeling regime which labels funds a certain way depending on their ESG credentials article 6 8 and 9 i guess that it's not surprising but but in some ways that that um we expect from an ESG perspective the regulatory landscape you know it's 68% uh 11% dramatically and 68% we're we'll seeing an increase in in the ESG requirements there's a lot of talk about green labeling here i think what was particularly caught my eye was this how much of a deterrent that was potentially to U.S. managers? Yes, thirty-six percent a large deterrent, sixty-three percent it's a small deterrent. So rather than potentially an opportunity, actually the U.S. manager maybe this is just the cohort that obviously complied with the survey. I think it's quite interesting. They didn't see this as an opportunity, but actually perhaps potentially 
a reason not to raise money or potentially not to commit to Europe. Susan, that, I mean, is that just a different where ESG is vis-a-vis here in Europe versus North America, or is it concern about the complying with, with these particular rules uh, and embedding that into the investment process? What do you think is, is, is kind of driving that reluctance or, or from, from US and North American managers? Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of, of both. I mean, I, I think, you know, the amount of disclosure required, um, as John mentioned, you know, there's nothing private about private equity. Um, the amount of disclosure required can be, you know, intimidating. It can be, um, you know, it, it can be it can be off-putting, um, you know, depending on your strategy that may simply not work for you. Um, I think the other thing, and this is kind of the other challenge for North American managers is that there are competing interests in the U.S. Um, different investors have different requirements about ESG. Some really want you to think about ESG. Some say you can't think about ESG. Um, <laughs> so, you know, how do you balance the, those two competing, you know, those two competing requirements? And then, so thinking when when a U.S. manager who's had that experience is looking at going into Europe, I think they get a little bit nervous about you know, a third, a third, you know, piece coming into the mix that, you know, is again going to be kind of challenging for them. You know, there's they're going to be faced with all these EU pensions who want them to do ESG, but yet they they've got to, you know, they've got to satisfy their their US investors as well who maybe don't want them to. So I think it can be, I, I think it can be very intimidating um just from uh, you know, how am I going to even just satisfy the needs of my investors? Not and and that and then the and the regulatory piece as well. Well, yeah, we I, definitely I see American managers who are messaging one message, which is is really without the ESG component. They're potentially downplaying it significantly. It, 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 it's in there. It's not like they're trying to hide anything, but it's clearly not the lead what they're leading with. And yet in Europe, it, it's front and center in terms of presentations, in terms of opportunity being asked for eight or nine. So that's a, an ESG sort of compliant uh, fund. It, it, it's a core to, to what they're looking to raise. And you can see that because that's probably a reflection as we look in and we look at the report, ESG, uh, 86% agree that there needs to be an ESG element to successfully launch a European fund. So you kind of almost feel they're playing to the domestic audience, as you alluded to, Susan, in one part, whilst in the, it, it, you know, playing what, what resonates in Europe, which is this ESG and, and, and 86% and think they have to have at least an angle to that. Sorry, Ben, I think you were about to comment. I, I was going to say that, that these these remarks are not unsurprising, I think, from a North American uh, survey universe. Having said that, I think that there has to be a positive message that attaches to this, and that is that with integration of sustainability into your investment process, it provides an added advantage or opportunity to gain access to the green capital that is available from Europe. If you have ambitions to raise capital, say in the Scandinavian markets, uh, certainly increasingly so in the UK with pension funds that, uh, that Susan mentioned, insurance companies that them, themselves embody stewardship responsibilities, that is now a requirement to adhere to sustainability standards. And if you could showcase those, then you are essentially, uh, you, your, your universe of uh, eligible investors is greater. And so this isn't just about meeting a regulatory standard and responding to a stick influence. There is that carrot influence as well, which is very much uh, allocation of what is probably the most active capital in the marketplace today. I will say the strategies that we are supporting where we're seeing the most active investor engagement are those which integrate fully impact and ESG oriented strategies. But this isn't just a regulatory issue. This is a data-driven issue as well. So if you look at the European, uh, the EET template that has to be completed, there are 1,200 data points that need to be captured by managers uh, in order to publish this, this report. Uh, and this is a technical report which service providers can assist with, but firms are really hitting that conceptual wall. How on earth am I going to be able to deliver it? But the beauty is that whilst regulations are getting sharper and the regulators are holding people to account for not greenwashing, overstating their credentials. The other side of it is that there are solutions providers and platforms that are beginning to offer greater innovative solutions to meeting this data issue. There's another part to this, which is climate risk integration and modelling. 
where you're able to achieve a far greater price transparency in how you model climate risks within your, 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 your portfolio, uh, which ensures that your managers are making much more effective decisions on entering assets and exiting assets. This transition risk, this physical risk is absolutely real and undeniable. And the fact is that managers have to integrate some of that modeling into their portfolios to make sure that they're not mispricing assets. It's as fundamental as that. And part many of these solutions are now integrating some of these uh, these capabilities, which is exciting from our perspective as uh, as an advisor in that space. Can I, can I just apologise? Oh. I dipped out for a second there. I apologise if, if I'm repeating anything, but um, but Ben, I, I think you make a, a really good point there. Um, but if this looks daunting to to, to Canadian and, and US uh, advisors and managers, it, it shouldn't be because um, because of this relative maturity uh, of, of these rules and investor expectations in the UK, there's the uh, those solutions on the market really are, um, are are quite well developed compared to um, uh, compared to in, in some other regions, uh, and 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 they can really take the take the pain away from the uh, from the manager. I always find um, that as part of any ESG discussion, what we really talk about is the E. And we spend a lot less time talking about the S and the G. Um, and you know, from my perspective, um, particularly the the G component, the governance component of ESG, that's been table stakes for as long as I've been working. Um, that hasn't changed. That's just good business practice that drives the right behavior, and I think is anticipated, expected by uh, by any sophisticated investor. But I think to um, maybe hone in on something that Susan was mentioning earlier, um, and I think you had brought it up in the context of, you know, it depends who your investor is. Do some people want you talking about yeah, e-factors and, and some people not? Um, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think it's about knowing what you're selling to who. And I think regulation keeps everyone honest in terms of are you, are you selling something that's truthful and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but the, the one thing that I would say has changed, and I'm not tracking this with really specific data, so I'd be interested in your opinions, but the thing that I find has changed is I used to participate in a lot of discussions where people would say um, the businesses with you know particularly strong ESG factors drive better returns. And that narrative, I think, is um, disappearing from the discussions that I'm having around the benefits of ESG. I think ESG is evolving into we should do this because it's for the good of society and therefore we need to regulate it. When there used to be a, a vein of discussion around businesses with great ESG factors will produce outsized, outsized returns and I think that hasn't hasn't shown through in the data whatsoever. So I just find that to be an interesting nuance. And maybe that applies more so to the E. I think nobody would argue that good governance around a company, Precisely. nobody would argue yeah. around more female participation in senior management, for instance, or on boards. E, e, those firms are always linked with superior returns on average than those sure. where there's group think, certain types of management style, um, uh, sort of lack of, of, of appropriate governance from board. So I think maybe that really elements the environmental, which is that there is a, a greater good uh, th that should be promoted. And in fact, under SFDR, that really is what Article 9 defines. Firms that forego to a degree, the primary concern is not financial return, but it is actually the the the, the change perhaps over and above. Um, totally. the, and the, Su Susan will be able to comment on this, but I think that's a major problem for a... Uh, a company in the US, like is your obligation, your fiduciary duty not to uh, to do what's best for, for a, a shareholder or a stockholder. Um, there could be some interesting conflict in that between Article 9 and what maybe some of your US investors might otherwise require you to do. Yeah, I, I would just comment that, um, I mean, there are bodies, industry bodies today. Pensions for Purpose is a body of which uh, we, we remember and contribute mm -hmm. uh, very significantly to, where there is an evolving view of what fiduciary responsibility means. And this is not focused on compromising financial returns uh, you know, at the expense of achieving uh, other impact-oriented uh, targets and goals. Uh, the truth is yeah. that there is data. And of course, there are always going to be differing views on this. So, uh, But it, it, there is a growing body of, uh, of evidence that uh, the integration of impact-aligned uh, uh, targets can actually achieve greater, stable, long-term returns. And some of that may well be related to the ability to integrate 
estimate uh, climate risks and, uh, and and other risk physical and transition risk modeling into effective pricing so in that respect, I'd be more than happy to share some of the data from those groups, which substantiates some of those those comments, because this has to be scientific. This cannot be, let's start with a, an industry view and retrofit to it. It has to be substantiated. And anybody that's arguing from an empty, baseless perspective, I'm afraid is never going to win. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, it, it really does uh, have to be founded in, in, in science. And, and that's the continuous perennial debate. Sure. Susan, I think you were, I think you were, um, you're obviously at the hot end yeah. of that with those American clients. Yeah, on the fiduciary duty point, I mean, you know, John makes a good point, right? You have to kind of put the interests of the fund, um, the interests of the fund first. I, I think the way, the way that U.S. managers um, and I presume Canadian managers too, because I think the fiduciary standards are similar, um, get, you know, can deal with that is right by appropriate disclosure in advance, exactly, you know, yeah. what you're considering, how you're thinking about it and, and telling folks, you know, this is what I'm going to balance. This is how I'm going to make decisions in that context, then I have to make the best decision for the fund. Um, but it, but it is, I mean, you know, it, it is something that, you know, pension fund and, you know, CIOs struggle with when they, you know, when they're thinking about making these investments as well, right? They're also fiduciaries, you know, so many fiduciaries out there thinking about how broad is, how broad is that responsibility where, you know, it, is it, is it amorphous? Is it, you know, is it global? Is it local? Um, and, and, and how long, how long are we, you know, what's our timeline? Um, yeah. And I think it's very difficult to, you know, tie folks down, um, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure an investor will come and try, right? But I think it's very difficult to try, to tie folks down, um, to, you know, to be particularly specific on that and say that somebody kind of has or has not met the duty um, when you're considering things like this that are, you know, yeah. very pieces of a very complex puzzle. Yeah, can absolutely. So, so maybe we'll wrap this up and, and wrap up two of the, the the other segments we 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 looked at. So one was. Um, we, when we asked them whether, you know, with they coming to Europe, were they thinking to access Europe in specifically uh, or setting a fund up in Europe, whether they were going to do an EU or a non-EU? And we need to remember, as I pointed out earlier, the UK, for instance, Channel Islands uh, mm. would be, and, and Switzerland would be considered a non-EU domicile. But, and then if they're going to do an EU where potentially they they may they may look and, and for what reasons they might go there. I think what's one of the, I think, yeah, I was certainly surprised, Ben. I know from from our conversations ahead of ahead of this uh, call that actually I, I would have thought that U.S. managers would be given the the, the previous passporting, this this European investor demand, the ESG elements in terms of Article Eight and Nine. I thought more managers would go onshore Europe than offshore, um, and yet we see forty eight percent are still looking for a non EU vehicle, fifty two percent in the EU. Um, Typically, that that would be either in, in Luxembourg or, or in Ireland. Typically, there are other domiciles. Um, is that what you all expected to see? Is this is this something of a surprise? What do we think might be behind that choice? Um, uh, maybe maybe um, Ben, I'll start with you, and then others feel free to jump in as we as we you know as we discuss. Um. It's a re really good point, and I think that the results were quite uh, surprising. Actually, that split almost down down the middle there. Um, what I would say is that offshore jurisdictions are absolutely relevant as tools in a manager toolbox for going to market. Uh, but there has been a progressive trend towards so-called onshoring in Europe today, where there is that need from a regulatory standpoint for. Uh, managers to demonstrate that regulatory substance, the uh, the tax substance that uh, we've we've talked about, and so uh, and investors have certainly a preference to see that a, a manager is committed to a territory and is building out a presence in uh, in the territory, and so all of those point to onshore uh, structures being preferred. There are also certain challenges, which are nuances, shall we say, uh, with uh, structures like Cayman, for instance, and the fact that uh, Cayman funds from time to time appear on the uh, the, the AML uh, grey list, 
And, uh, and what does that mean? That doesn't mean that it's an absolute impediment for investors to access funds, not at all. And I think it's very much misunderstood. What does it mean, however? It means that it triggers certain enhanced due diligence requirements for investors, where they have to get comfortable with the framework that applies and whether there are heightened risks associated with investments uh, in, in products from certain jurisdictions. And what this is, is nothing more than a headwind for investors to access and and, and uh, invest in, in certain products. And so from a fundraiser's perspective, my job is to minimize the headwinds, minimize the hurdles and minimize the chances for the investor to say, uh, sorry, on a tacticality, that's a no. And so the onshore jurisdictions today is almost that path of least resistance for, for investors to say, yes, I know it, I trust it, and I'm willing to invest in it. And this is key within that uh, that invest, investor due diligence process today. So, uh, but let's look at Channel Islands. Let's look at domestic funds in France and Germany, for instance. There is often a need for very specific fund go-to-market plans uh, for certain jurisdictions because of the investor preference, but also because of the regulatory alignment. So these are all things that have to be unpacked as part of that target market assessment, that go-to-market plan, that product design and development process. And so, again, you've got to look at the wrappers, the structures as tools in the toolbox, all of which are relevant, all of which are credible, but all of which have different ramifications for, for managers in their distribution process. And Susan, does that reflect when they come to you? Is that a 50-50 split? Is that what you see or, or are you seeing something different? You know, it, it really isn't. So I was surprised by this as well. Um, I really have not been seeing folks um, looking offshore Europe um, when they're when they're looking to target European investors. I, I've mostly seen onshore. I wondered when I saw the data. We go back to kind of one of the first slides, right? We talked about who's using NPPR and who's using reverse solicitation. Still, I wondered if you if we broke this data down by by those options, right? Uh, you know, onshore, if you're using the passport, of course, and then maybe, you know, I would be interested to see the people who are saying offshore, are they only planning to do NPPR? Are they, you know, do they have a more limited target market? Um, are they just going to be in, as we call it, the beer drinking countries as opposed to the wine drinking countries? You know, um, you know, I, th I think it, I think there's, there are probably a lot of factors that underlie these results, but I, I was surprised as well. I think maybe we should just clarify this isn't we don't there's no discrimination between beer drinking and wine drinking. Of course. It's, it's, a loose, it's, it's less to do with our alcoholic preferences and more to do with the description of uh, northern Europeans, typically Germans, yes. uh, the, the Dutch, uh, Scandinavians, UK. National private placement typically is still quite uh, doable, for want of a better word. Uh, the wine drinking companies, typically more southern Europe, so France, Spain, Italy in particular, um, tend to have, um, Portugal tend to have a limited ability now under under their domestic rules to to reverse solicit or it's prohibited uh, completely. So so that that is uh, that's the that's sorry, much much better said than I did. I know. <laughs> I, I mean, I've always used the wine and beer drinking, but out of context, it just sounds like a, a pref. <laughs> a yeah, preference yeah. for a tipple. I think the thing is, I wonder also whether it's been it's been uh, slightly affected by people who are yes Europe. And again, if we look at people who are looking to raise money in Europe, it's very rare that that's the limits of their ambition. The Middle East is often grouped into that. People are looking to Asia, Singapore, and Japan potentially. So I think wherever there are balls of capital, Australia, there is interest. And so I think often whilst the passport is important in Europe and there is a certain brand recognition for certain fund structures elsewhere, I think people are saying, well, Europe is a small part. So, and if you look, some people are looking to raise 10, 15% in Europe, or perhaps another 5%, 10% in the Middle East, or perhaps another 5, 10% in Asia. Are those people thinking, well, I can't build, a, I can't on the scale, the scale we discussed the size manager, I can't build a domestic fund that Ben alluded to in each of these markets or a regional yeah. fund. I need what gives me the widest possible distribution. And perhaps that is still to a degree, occasionally uh, for certain audiences, um, a, a Cayman fund or a Jersey Guernsey structure as it, as it may be. Or, or are you really only targeting a specific market like the UK and then a UK fund? And again, if we actually look, where were you looking? We can see that actually Jersey and Guernsey and, and the UK uh, Jersey's not far behind that Luxembourg and Ireland, and, and perhaps that's due to that target audience. Um, in the Middle East are very familiar, particularly Sharia structures in that. So, so maybe that. 
maybe just the final thing we'll look at then. Maybe obviously we can see it was it was kind of 50 50 or, or thereabouts in terms of onshore offshore. And then if we look and then why Ireland or why Luxembourg? I think what was quite interesting was is I felt like the Irish one was almost decisions was almost more emotive than than actually the, the Lux one, which was very specific regulation, tax, uh, and and infrastructure and expertise, service provision. Even though we like you, Susan, have offices in both, and many service providers do, but actually when you've asked the the, the, the audience, the the, the the managers, they were sort of well uh, tax advice, but, but cult, cultural and, and connectivity and timeline sort of pulled more into Ireland. For this particular audience, um, is is you know um, maybe John, you obviously looks like you, you're going for Luxembourg, and 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 was there ever a point where it was either or? What would what swayed you ultimately to go in Luxembourg? Was it the reasons that we see here? Was it something else? Was it investor driven? What 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 made you eventually go for for that Luxembourg sort of um, race that you've gone for? Well, Paul, I think you told us we should go Luxembourg. But um, <laughs> I, more, more, more seriously, though, I think we, we definitely considered Ireland, but it was really around we had heard before we did our work um, that Ireland was going to be a much less expensive jurisdiction um, for us to c- considering operating out of. So, um, I, 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 and perhaps that still remains to be true, but we ultimately landed on we thought it was the path of least resistance to go with Lux because people would understand exactly what we were doing with the Lux structure. And as a first time uh, group raising capital in Europe, that just seemed to be the right decision. And maybe that would change. I mean, I think the Irish Limited Partnership, which is which is a relatively new construct, but long in long in, in, in gestation, but gestation, but only recently last two years. Again, maybe if we would have that conversation in two, three years time, maybe right. it would, it, that that you, you'd feel differently the market take time to move. I mean, Susan, when they when your US managers come to you, do they also have that sort of preconceived cost or, or market perception from an investor perspective, or are they much more open than maybe historically they were to to for real assets? We're just talking about here, obviously, uh, an, an Irish or a Luxembourg, or are they still leaning heavily towards that Luxembourg vehicle? I, I'd, I'd say they're still leaning. Maybe not heavily, but they're still leaning toward Lux. I think we get a lot of questions about Ireland. Um, you know, it is a new it is a new structure. You know, they are still building up service providers there. Um, in, but I think we do get people who are really interested for some of the reasons you have at the top. You know, cultural considerations, language considerations. You know, slightly better time zone. Um, and, and you know, slightly less process around you know setting up entities and bank accounts. Um, that being said, you know, there are other things that are happening that are new in Ireland um, and there might be more complexity around those. So I think there's, you know, really, a you know, trade off and, and you really never kind of know what you're going to get. And and I, I think you're right, Paul, you know, it'll be interesting to see kind of two years down the road, three years down the road, once the Irish structures are are more common and once the Irish service providers have had more experience, you know, whether whether there continues to be kind of like a, a stronger preference for for Lux or or whether it you know starts to fall out more evenly. Yeah. Okay. I I just say I just say that some of our managers really uh, describe an issue of Luxembourg fatigue in some ways where they accept the imperative of of investing in launching products from a leading jurisdiction, but they experience the pain points and limitations that come from it and. There's no question that Ireland over recent years has been closing that gap. And and I see that as very much a positive uh, contribution to the industry. You know, a competitive domicile creates a competitive regional uh, marketplace and it's good for the industry. It drives innovation, it drives client standards and it drives cost efficiencies as as well. And so the innovations with the uh, the Irish ILP reforms, the introduction of the LTIF regime in Ireland, it's important for, for managers to carefully consider whether that is a jurisdiction that can achieve what it needs to. And there's no question that as between Ireland and Luxembourg, investors aren't going to say necessarily, well, one is a preference over another. It does come down to some of those soft factors and what best aligns with the manager culture and where it wants to build its its business and platform from but the access to Europe from either of those is uh, either of those, those domiciles is equal and so in that respect uh, there should be no impediment uh, going to market from uh, from either Ireland or, or Luxembourg uh, for or, or, or other domiciles for that matter. Okay. 
Great. Well, I think with that, we're probably out of time. Uh, <laughs> run over a little bit, but um, I did want to thank uh, my fellow panelists, uh, Susan, Ben, John and Ed. Thank you for your insightful comments on that research. Uh, the research is available online from the Aquarium website, uh, Um And uh, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Thank you ever so much. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us.